is off tonight. The Victoria ISD is facing a rise in social media threats and incidents at campuses. Schools nationwide are seeing the same trend. 25 News Now reporter Trenton Whiting has more information on how the district and law enforcement are addressing this issue. Trenton. Shauna, thank you. The rising number of social media threats in Victoria ISD is a major concern with the district and local law enforcement. The main message, violators should expect steep charges and those who recklessly share posts could share a felony sentence as well. They say that posting or sharing unverified information about emergencies on social media could cause additional chaos and is considered a state felony. Victoria ISD has dealt with a rash of weapon-related threats in the early part of the school year. The response from the district and law enforcement has focused on expressing how serious they take these threats and how serious the charges are. Sheriff Marr says they already have had 15 arrests since the school year started. Last week, starting on Monday, October 7th, was the first week of the year with no arrests or threats. The sheriff's office is still expressing the importance of staying vigilant and responding to threats quickly. This time is of the essence. You want to find out where the threat's coming from, see if there's any credibility to it or not. Making a false report on a threat may also have the same penalties as making the threat yourself. Legal experts say that those who share info they know is false or can't verify could lead to legal action similar to yelling fire in a theater or bomb in an airport. Because if you knowingly repeat or make a report of something that you know not to be true, then you can be uh, charged with a crime. Law enforcement shared the sentiment by saying people should call the department to report threats instead of using social media. There's no tolerance on this um, if you're a part of it. We want you to report it to law enforcement, but don't report it on your own social media platforms. VISD held a conference in September addressing the threats featuring several reps from police to the district attorney's office. They all shared the message that students should avoid interacting with threats on social media and that the consequences could be dire. Uh, you don't want to go through your life, especially the, these young men and women with that. I mean, it can hinder you getting jobs and all kinds of things. Trenton Whiting, KAVU-TV, 25 News Now. This brings us to our viewer poll for today. Have you talked to your child about social media threats at school? Yes or no? We want to hear from you. Come to crossroadstoday.com slash vote to participate, or you can simply scan the QR code there on your screen. And we've kind of flip-flopped here uh, within the last hour. Um, we were at a majority no, and then now here at six, we have 53% of you saying that you have talked to your children. So continue to vote, and we'll have the latest results on 25 News Now at 10. The Victoria Independent School District is narrowing down candidates for superintendent. A pool of eight candidates has been reduced to three for the second round of interviews. Those will be held tonight through Wednesday. A lone finalist is expected to be announced on Thursday. Once the trustees announce a lone finalist, state law requires a minimum 21 day waiting period for the community to gather background information on the candidate and have opportunities for the candidate to meet with stakeholders to address any questions or concerns that may arise. A driver hits a utility pole bringing down a power line. This happened just before two this afternoon on Guy Grant Road at Castleway. The power line was a neutral line, so there were no power outages as a result. The driver said she sneezed while turning onto Castleway, causing her to hit the pole. Luckily, she was not hurt in the crash. Well, Airline Road between Main Street and Navarro Street will close overnight Tuesday for a utility tie-in. This is part of the construction of the public safety headquarters. The road will close at 10 p.m. Tuesday and reopen at 3 a.m. Wednesday. Motorists should drive cautiously and obey all signs and barricades posted in the work zone. Through traffic can avoid any delays by seeking alternate routes. Well, we're getting a little bit of a cool down this week. <laughs> Not quite fall yet, but First Warren Storm Team Chief Meteorologist Mac Perez joins us with a look ahead. We Mac. are so excited that we, we may actually get down into the 80s uh, later this week. Today was a hot one. As a matter of fact, the temperature got up to a record. We were at 99 degrees this afternoon. Doesn't feel much like October, uh, but there is a front and that will help us a little bit. We'll talk about that and take a look at the tropics coming up in a moment. All right, definitely looking forward to it. Well, FEMA was forced to pause aid in several areas impacted by Hurricane Helene in North Carolina over the weekend over re reported threats toward responders. The Ashe County Sheriff said some FEMA operations were paused in the county out of an abundance of caution Sunday. 
The county emergency management office says it was due to threats in some counties. The pauses came amid a backdrop of misinformation about responses to recent storms. Assistance was expected to resume today. A 44 year old North Carolina man was arrested over the weekend and charged with a misdemeanor related to threats against FEMA. He has since been released on bond. Texans are invited to join a Red Cross shelter volunteer training session. This will be on October 17th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at First Baptist Church in Bay City. The training equips you to assist disaster victims both locally and nationwide. As a Red Cross volunteer, you can deploy across the country for at least 14 days with all travel expenses covered. Lunch will be provided during the training session. For more information on how to register for the training, visit our website, crossroadstoday.com. In an engineering feat, mechanical SpaceX arms catch a Starship rocket booster back at the launch pad. SpaceX has pulled off the boldest test flight yeah, yet of its enormous Starship rocket. Elon Musk's company caught the returning booster yeah, back at the Texas launch pad with mechanical arms shortly after liftoff Sunday. Towering almost 400 feet, the empty Starship blasted off from the southern tip of Texas. It arced over the Gulf of Mexico, like the four Starships before it, that ended up being destroyed, though. This latest demo successfully brought the first stage booster back to land seven minutes after liftoff. The launch tower was mo has monstrous metal arms, dubbed chopsticks, that caught the descending 232-foot booster. The spacecraft at launch splashed into the Indian Ocean precisely as planned. Well, now to a terrifying and deadly home invasion. Authorities say two men posed as utility workers at a home in Michigan and then killed the 72 year old homeowner in what they believe was a targeted incident. ABC's Zorin Shaw has the story. For DTE. Today, the second suspect in this brazen, deadly home invasion is under arrest after authorities say two men posing as phony utility workers We're for gas a leaks. local energy company looking for gas leaks arrived at this home in Rochester Hills, an upscale neighborhood near Detroit on Thursday night. This ring doorbell shows one mass suspect in a vest holding a fake ID badge, then showing what is fake company letterhead. We're checking for gas leaks. The homeowners didn't allow them in that night, but officials say they returned the following morning and were let in. The homeowner, 72 year old Hussein Murray, a pawn shop owner, leads them to the basement where officials believe he was murdered. Absolutely premeditated. You know, they came to the house with a, a fake DTE placard on the side of a pickup truck. They came up to the house with a work vest on and with a fake identification card, and they came with that clipboard as well. Police say they duct taped Murray's wife and then searched the home. They may have thought there was valuables in the home due to the business and were trying to get whatever those valuables were. The energy company says if anyone arrives at your home or business and claims to be an employee, ask to see a badge with a photo ID. Also verify the information with the company. If they refuse, do not allow them in. And if they become agitated or act strange, call 911. Zoreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Some meal kits are being recalled due to possible listeria contamination. The meal kits produced by Reeser's Fine Foods were sold under the brand names Bistro 28 and Don Poncho. They could contain chicken that's been recalled due to a listeria risk. The meal kits were sold in 30 states. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration said you should not consume any part of the kit. Instead, you should return the item to the store for a full refund or just throw it out. More information can be found at FDA.gov. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Crossroads Today. Hit the like button and click the notification bell while you're there to receive alerts whenever there are new videos posted. Well, stay with us. Coming up on 25 News Now at 6, how Ted Cruz and Colin Allred are putting on another big U.S. Senate battle in Texas. And the candidates for president were crisscrossing the battleground states this weekend with just over three weeks until Election Day.
back. Texas is seeing another fierce political showdown this October. At the heart of it is Democrat Colin Allred, a former NFL linebacker, now vying to unseat Republican Senator Ted Cruz. Allred's moderate, cool-headed approach contrasts with Cruz's fiery partisan style, making this race one of the Democrats' best chances to flip a Senate seat and maintain their majority. With campaign ads flooding the airwaves and over $120 million spent, both sides are ramping up efforts. Allred, aiming to become Texas's first black senator, is focusing on abortion rights and Cruz's infamous Cancun trip. Meanwhile, Cruz warns supporters that Democrats have their sights on Texas. This race is shaping up to be a close one, echoing Cruz's tight 2018 win over Beto O'Rourke. The two candidates will debate tomorrow night. Well, for the first time since they beca became their party's official nominees, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris today are campaigning in the same state on the same day. And with almost three weeks until Election Day, the race for the White House is getting even tighter. New polling from ABC News and Ipsos shows a dead heat between the two candidates. ABC News' Perry Russum is in Washington. In the final weeks of the race for the White House, new polling from ABC News and Ipsos shows Vice President Kamala Harris at 50 percent, former President Trump at 48 percent. That's within the margin of error. Harris is running mate Governor Tim Walz in Wisconsin today. We're closing on opportunity for all. We're closing on middle class matters. We're closing on investing in education. Harris and Trump on opposite ends of must win Pennsylvania. Harris and Erie focusing on mobilizing black male voters. Donald Trump's not going to win black men. Uh, he's not going to win a majority of them. But if he doesn't lose as badly as he has in the past, if he's able to win a quarter of them, that's a huge difference. And it makes it makes a difference in some of the most important battlegrounds. Trump with a town hall outside Philadelphia before heading to Georgia. Early voting starts there tomorrow. Former President Bill Clinton now on the campaign trail, rallying for Harris in Georgia. All we got to do is show up. If we show up, we'll win. In California, investigators are looking into the background of a man who was arrested near a Trump rally this weekend with multiple guns and ammunition. Authorities say he's part of a far right group. Sources tell ABC News there is no evidence he made any threats against Trump. What we do know is he showed up with multiple passports with different names, an unregistered vehicle with fake license plate and loaded firearms. And new today, Harris has agreed to do a sit-down interview with Fox News that will happen on Wednesday. It's her first ever sit-down interview with the network. Perry Russell, ABC News, Washington. Well, we are looking at 97 degrees right about now. 97 degrees, mid-October. Our high was, uh, we're going to check that. It wasn't 98, it was 99, a new record for the date. Uh, we're supposed to be about 85. Now, with a little luck, there's a fertile system that might get us to the mid 80s. Wouldn't that be a nice cooling trend? We'll talk more about it coming up after this.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Lots of sunshine and lots of warm temperatures. Doesn't feel much like October, but there's a little hope in sight. It's actually a frontal system that's just to the north of us. It's kind of slowed down right now, but uh, by the time we get to Wednesday, early, early in the morning, it's going to blow in and we're going to get a nice little north wind that's actually a little cooler than what we have right now. What we have right now is, of course, high pressure on top of us, abundant sunshine and a strong southerly wind that gave us the heat that you uh, felt out there. Now that frontal system is not a um, a rainmaker or a snowmaker. As far as we're concerned, it's just a wind shift. You can see how our winds are definitely out of the southeast. And of course, that adds to the warmth that we had today. Then we uh, are looking for temperatures to knock down at least to the 80s uh, by the end of this week, which is pretty exciting considering other than that, we got nothing going on. And in terms of rainfall, we are not happening uh, in that department either. These are the forecast highs tomorrow. You can see how it's still in the 90s, but up north we've got that cool air eventually getting down here, but that's not till about Wednesday. You can see how it's still going to be a toasty day across much of the state on your Tuesday. Now, last week we talked about this area of possible development here, and uh, you can see this big bloom right south in uh, Central America. This is part of that system, but the thing is that it developed a much farther well, not you know farther south than originally anticipated. We thought it would be here, and right now the computer models will take whatever develops, go right across Central America and into the Pacific. So we have less of a concern uh, regarding that area of development. So you know we're okay. Um, then we take a look at the big picture. We see the Atlantic. There's another potential development right here, about a 60% chance of moving across and getting into um, in the Caribbean. Now the question is. What happens after that? Right now, because of the way high pressure is settled over the country, uh, it's more likely also going to be moving to the west uh, pretty quickly. So we'll certainly be watching it for you. Now, as far as we're concerned, you can see uh, this is the GFS over the next seven days. You'll notice how high pressure is in control, and that's keeping system number one moving west. And guess what? It's going to keep system number two moving west as well. So like I always say, high pressure generally shows up in October uh, with cooler air up north, and that keeps the storm systems out of our area, which is what we're looking for. Otherwise, sunny skies looks like another beautiful day. Looking at about a 92 tomorrow in the Port Lavaca area. And in Cuero, 96, a little on the warm side, I understand, but there's a little hope on the horizon. By Wednesday morning, you'll feel, that, so Tuesday is a hot day, by Wednesday morning, you'll feel that nice northeast wind blowing in, and that'll knock the temperature down to a whopping 82, then 83 Thursday. And this 20% you see right here is just moisture rolling back into the crossroads that may give us one or two little spotty showers. Not enough really to break the, the drought we were in because we're now at about 35 days of not having any rainfall here in the crossroads. That is your seven day forecast. Reminding everybody, we do have a QR code. We'd love for you to scan that. Put Crossroads today on your phone. And now here's Shauna. All right, definitely need that rain, but we'll take the break from the heat as well. well. Now we send it over to Max Williams, who has a look at what's coming up in sports. Yeah, Shauna, I mean, the Lions and Cowboys played yesterday, but the Lions, they got a big win, but they had some tough news there with one of their players. I'll tell you more in sports.
All right, everyone, we've made it through week seven here of high school football. We're basically past the halfway point. We had some surprises, some not so upsets, but we're going to look ahead now to week eight. And we got a big matchup to look out for the Quero Gobblers versus the Sinton Pirates. Both of these teams, they head into this game on winning ways, right? Quero is five and two this season, while the Sinton Pirates, they're out of corpus, are six and oh right now. And they've scored place for the Pirates over 20 points in each of their games they played this season. So they look very impressive. They're one of the top offenses and top ranked there here in 4A. So this will be a challenge for Cuero. And they're hoping to get their offense going. They did lose against star quarterback Jackson Marie earlier in the year. And they've had to try to find a way to get that offense going again. And one of the players that's kind of been consistent, though, is wide receiver Walker Beats. And he's been a factor throughout the entire year. Had two touchdown catches last week in last week's game. And so this one, I think it's going to go back and forth. We'll see how this one goes here. I go down to the wire here coming up this week. And now this leads us here to our viewer poll where again I asked everyone out of all these three of these players right now who you thought was the impact player of last week there in week seven. And here are the options. Refurio's Jordan King, Quero wide receiver Walker Dietz, or Yoakum quarterback Trey Cuellar. And here's what people chose. Looks like it's a battle right now between Walker Dietz and Trey Cuellar right now. you there from Yoakum for Cuellar and then Dietz from Quero. So see who gets it here. I mean we've had these people on our viewer poll a couple of times. They've been outstanding athletes there on the football Field. So we'll see how it changes up here going into the 10 o'clock show. Now from our viewer poll to Dave Campbell's Texas High School rankings here for, you know, every week we like to showcase what's happening here in the high school ranks. And here's what we got here from our area here in the top 10. In 4A, we got El Campo Ricebirds. They're ranked at number 5 right now. And you got in 3A Division 1, the Edna Cowboys are number 4. Goliad is at number 8 right now. And then right now staying the same there in 2A Division 1, Refurio is still at number 2. Ganado is at number 3. And then again, you look at it at the below, 2A Division 2, Shine there gets in there at number 10 right now for the Shiner Comanches there they get to play at home versus Fall City this week now again we just talked about high school rankings but we're going to college football rankings here there was a complete different type of change here from again here in this week and here's what we got Texas still stays the top of number one but the Oregon Ducks they moved to number two after they beat Ohio State man that was a tough loss for sure for my Buckeyes there that they dropped down to number four but then you look at the other top five. Penn State there is actually there at number three. Georgia is at number five. Miami, Florida is at number six. Alabama is at seven. LSU jumps up five spots here in the poll outside the top ten at number 13. Now at number eight. Iowa State's at number nine. And then Clemson is at number ten. We got some big matchups here in college football. Georgia goes to Texas this week and Alabama. They travel to Tennessee. So I could probably shake up the top ten going into this week. And end the show here tonight. Even though the Detroit Lions, they beat up the Dallas Cowboys yesterday, 47-9. to They did lose one of those car players in defensive end, Aiden Hutchinson, as he was carted off the field after injuring his leg in yesterday's game. Hutchinson, again, was the leader on the team for the Lions in sacks, tackles for loss, and just an all-around defense there for Aiden Hutchinson. This is a huge a loss for the Lions, and they right now are currently in second place in the it's NFC North at 4-1, and one, while the Vikings still undefeated there at 5 and 0 oh, leading the NFC North. That's going to do it here in sports. Shauna, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Max. Well, we're back in a moment. Two giant pandas are on their way from China to Washington's National Zoo, kicking off a much awaited return of the beloved bears to the American capital. Stay with us.
Giant pandas are on their way to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. from China. Bao Li and Ching Bao are traveling on a FedEx Boeing 777 cargo jet dubbed the Panda Express. They're both three years old and will be the first pair that Washington has received in 24 years. The zoo's last three pandas returned to China last year. The loan is part of China's panda diplomacy program. In the past, the pandas were one of the zoo's biggest attractions and it drew in millions of visitors. Bali is a male and his name means uh, precious vigor. Ching Bao is female and her name means green treasure. Mm. So interesting uh, yeah. meanings behind <laughs> their names, but uh, if you're headed out to Washington, D.C., then yeah. you can stop by the zoo and, and check out the new pandas. <laughs> Shauna, never a panda she'll go, she's going to miss. Okay, mm. so if there's I a love pan pandas. <laughs> we're going to get yes. it on there. So, always love the pandas. So. For you, we're looking yeah. for another hot day before finally things change for us by the time we get to Thursday. All right, we'll see you at 10.